We've all had that moment, you know the one, where you've been up spending countless hours working on your mix, you wake up the next morning keen to hear the results of all your hard work. So you take your song out to the car, maybe take a trip around the block, and you fire up your mix, only to have your jaw drop because it sounds nothing like the masterpiece that you remember creating last night. Maybe the bass is too loud, muddy, and indistinct. Perhaps the vocals are getting masked by other mid-range elements and you are having trouble hearing the lyrics. Or maybe the high end is just overcooked and it's too loud and harsh and you feel like you have to pull the whole song down in volume. Either way, either your speakers or headphones, or your room, or your brain, or maybe all three have lied to you. Your mix doesn't translate. What do I mean by that? Translation means that decisions or judgments you make when crafting your music on one playback system and listening environment also sound correct when the same music is listened to on a different playback system and listening environment. There's consistency. Maybe you're listening to the low end of your song and you feel like the kick needs to come up a little bit relative to the bass. So you nudge it up by a couple of dB. When listening back, you're like, yeah, that's the right move. So you render out your mix. Say you take it over to your friend's place now, you fire it up on his Bluetooth speaker. Sounds good there. You listen on a set of laptop speakers. Also sounds good. You play it at the club. Sounds great there. Maybe you throw it on your iPhone and listen on your AirPods. If it sounds great there, pat yourself on the back because it means that that mix decision translates. But that's not usually how it goes, is it? Usually, when you take your mix and you play it back on other systems, you're shocked because you hear these super cringeworthy mistakes that you're surprised you didn't catch when you were listening the first time. Your mix doesn't translate because of problems with speakers, problems with rooms, and problems with psychoacoustics. We're gonna dive into each one of these things individually. When it comes to speakers, you have resonances created by the dimensions of the cabinets. Just like you have modes and standing waves in rooms, you have the same types of issues that correspond to the distance between the surfaces that the cabinets are made out of. Now in really high-end speakers, these will be very well damped and controlled. There'll be minimal issues, but even in professional studio monitors, things on the lower end, resonances can be a really significant issue that actually warrant correction. The next speaker issue has to do with crossovers. So any speaker that is multi-way, meaning it has different drivers for different frequency ranges, like the KH420s behind me you see here have a bass driver, they have a mid driver and a treble driver. They're a three-way multi-way speaker. Well, at each crossover frequency point, you have directivity issues. And that relates to the frequency that the driver is trying to produce relative to the actual size of the driver. And we have this thing called directionality, right? So as the frequency becomes very, very, very small relative to the driver size, then the frequency becomes more beamy or more directional. Whereas if the frequency is really big in comparison to the size of the driver, like with bass, then it tends to emanate more spherically. And when a speaker is throwing sound out to the sides because it's not as directional, then that creates room gain. You have reflection off of the boundaries in the room. And what that means at the end of the day, if we land the plane, is that you have oftentimes bumps in perceived loudness in the frequency response at the crossover points or around the crossover points. And that's something that also can warrant correction. Speakers will also acoustically couple with surfaces that they're placed on. So for example, if you have speakers that are placed on the meter bridge of a console or on your desk, then they'll actually start vibrating the surface that they're on and turning it into a really bad speaker. And the sound that's emanating from those sympathetic coupled vibrations will end up blurring and distorting your perception of the direct true sound coming from the speaker. For this reason, it's a best practice in terms of acoustics to have your monitors mounted on stands or flush in the wall like you see behind me and acoustically decoupled from whatever stands or surface that they're on. You need at least two speakers for sound playback, right? You have stereo, you have a left and a right. Well, it's very common to have slight or sometimes not so slight differences in frequency response between your two speakers. And that's just because it's impossible to create perfectly matched driver sets. All drivers will go through some type of manufacturing and quality assurance process where there's a bit of error tolerance. That can be as little as about plus or minus one or one and a half dB on very, very high resolution high end speakers, or oftentimes plus or minus three dB. So now imagine you're mixing and within the given range frequency response for your speakers, which could be 30 to 20,000 Hertz, there's a plus or minus three dB on either speaker. That means the left speaker and the right speaker at the same frequency could be out by as much as six dB. 
How do you make panning decisions if there's a 6 dB level difference? That's gonna distort your perception of the location of sounds in the stereo field. So this is something that definitely warrants testing and potential correction if there's an issue. Thankfully, Digital EQ can correct this, smoothing out the soundstage and improving your sense of stereo field so you can make better decisions. When you're recording or engineering music, you need to be able to hear the full frequency spectrum. If you can't, then you'll oftentimes not catch errors in your recordings, or you might be prone to making mistakes in the mixing and mastering phase. You can't mix what you can't hear, after all. And for this reason, a lot of professional studios have full range monitoring systems. Now, these tend to be expensive and also very large. So a lot of DIY and home-based studios, due to budgetary restrictions and space restrictions, will opt for smaller monitors. The problem is they have a big downside. Speakers and headphones all have a low frequency roll off. It's most pronounced as small drivers like five inch to eight inch drivers attempt to produce frequencies under 60 Hertz. This is why a lot of speakers are enclosed in cabinets that have bass reflex ports. The port creates additional sound pressure level at its tuning frequency that can extend the low frequency response of a driver that would otherwise be rolling off. For example, I had previous to this studio, a pair of Dynaudio BM12 Mark III speakers, and they had a bass reflex port that was tuned to 70 Hertz, which was right around where the low frequency response started rolling off. Even with ports, every speaker still has eventual low frequency roll off, and you can't get your way around that because physics, which is why subs exist. And imagine that you're trying to mix the low end of your song. How can you do that when there's not enough sound pressure level down there? So it's really important that you have low frequency extension. Otherwise, you might not be able to really hear the differences between kick drum bodies and the effects that you're doing that might process those, things that might be affecting and impacting bass notes, or maybe problems like a truck driving by outside and getting into your recording, or a vocalist tapping the mic stand with her foot. Now let's talk about problems with rooms. So let's say you've done your research and saved up a bunch of money and you've bought an amazing set of studio monitors. They're pretty much ideal, which means they have a flat anechoic response and they have a smoothly changing off axis response as well. What does that mean in English? Well, a flat anechoic response means that in an anechoic chamber, a specialized sound chamber that basically sucks any frequency out of the room from all angles, they are gonna sound completely true, meaning that they're not gonna accentuate any particular frequency, and that's usually desirable. A uh, smoothly changing off axis response means that as you begin to change your listening position from directly in front of the way the speaker's pointed to an angle off to the side of that, that it will have a very smooth change in how sound is projected to the sides. And both of those things are generally desirable. So you take your beautiful new speakers and you put them in a room, because you know, that's where you listen to speakers, and you realize now that the room can have an even larger impact on what you hear than the speakers themselves. In fact, even a $30,000 or $50,000 set of speakers can sound rubbish if they're put in a square box of a room like your standard residential office or bedroom. As you'll learn in our section about acoustics, rooms have a plethora of ways of changing the sound of your precious speakers. And unfortunately, many of them aren't good especially if your room doesn't have any acoustic treatment and hasn't been set up considering the best practices of acoustics. The reflective boundaries in rooms and the corresponding constructive and destructive interference that they cause can create huge boosts and dips called peaks and nulls in the frequency response all across the audible range. These are oftentimes most prominent in the bass region. Another thing that you'll have to contend with is modal ringing or resonances where particular frequencies get amplified and they ring out much longer than other frequencies. Again, this is a problem that dominates and plagues the bass range because it corresponds to the wavelength that fits between two of your room boundaries. Close proximity direct reflections off of your sidewalls, floor, and ceiling are the worst offenders. And if your desk is positioned in such a way that you get a reflection off of the desk surface that meets your ears out of phase, that's gonna create comb filtering. All of these things combined to kind of smear your perception of stereo field, making it difficult to sometimes make panning decisions and to be able to obscure your perception of transients, which can make it difficult to be able to set time-based parameters like compressor attack times. When you engineer music in a room, what you hear is the cumulative effect of the direct sound from your speakers combined with the overlapping interfering responses of each one of the reflections. And unfortunately, this creates a set of unique acoustical issues that applies to your room alone. 
So when you make decisions around the music, you might be compensating for issues that only exist in that specific acoustical space, meaning that they won't translate to other acoustical spaces. And this is what we call in the mixing and mastering world, chasing ghosts. In professional studios, getting mixes that translate well to other environments is the primary goal, as well as doing it quickly. Time is money in this industry after all. So you'll see the extensive use of thick acoustic absorber modules on the sidewalls, ceiling, and back wall, creating what's called a non-environment room or an RFZ, a reflection-free zone. In this type of room, the engineer at the mix position hears almost exclusively the direct sound coming from the speakers, unaltered, perhaps augmented by a little bit of scattered sound from diffusion on the back wall. I work in one of these types of rooms, and the accuracy of sound and the perception of the full range of frequencies is just amazing and unparalleled. I, I, can't, I can't promote listening in one of these types of rooms enough, but they're expensive, complex to build, and they take a lot of space. So they're not practical for the vast majority of us. At the end of the day, we have to work in the rooms that we have and figure out ways of optimizing them the best way we possibly can. Now let's talk about psychoacoustics. Psychoacoustics is the study of how our anatomy, our ears, and our brains receive and perceive sound. It's a really deep and expansive field, deep dive territory for sure. So I'm just gonna share a couple of the ways that psychoacoustics can lead us astray when we're making or listening to music. One really important concept to get in psychoacoustics is that we perceive sounds that are shorter as quieter and sounds that are longer as louder, even if they're at the exact same peak level. Let's look at an audio example. This sound is as short as it gets, a one sample impulse. Technically, it's also as loud as it gets because it's maxed all the way up to zero dB full scale. It contains all frequencies as well, but you don't hear it as very loud, do you? Okay, let's listen to another example. This sound is much longer, but at much lower amplitude actually. Despite the lower level, we actually hear it as louder. So how might this concept affect us when we're engineering music? Well, let's say your room has boundaries that are four meters apart. That would create a standing wave in that room of 85.75 Hertz and multiples of that frequency. If you were to say, hit that frequency with a kick drum or a synth bass note, it would get excited. And because that frequency corresponds to one of the standing waves, it would resonate or ring out, giving you a one bass note feel. Even if notes around it were hitting different notes, that one frequency would dominate what you're hearing. And then if you were to go to be in the mixing phase, how would you deal with that frequency? Because you psychoacoustically perceive it as louder because of the longer decay time, you would likely try and reduce it using subtractive EQ. But then if you took that mix into another room that had boundaries of different distances apart and that standing wave didn't exist, you might hear a big hole in your bass in the track. So again, this is a translation issue. This phenomenon is more pronounced at lower frequencies in smaller rooms and especially in rooms that are not treated. So when you add acoustic treatment to a room, not only are you damping the frequencies, but you're also widening the cue of the room modes. So what do I mean by that? These resonant frequencies that are corresponding to your room modes, they have a width to the mode, and that corresponds to the modal bandwidth. Well, acoustic treatment ends up widening the cue. So it brings the peak of the mode down and it widens it such that it's more likely to sound more even with the modes that are adjacent to it. Also in the bass range, it's important to point out that our critical auditory bands are much narrower. What does that mean? It means that you can hear differences in frequency or differences in the amplitude of adjacent frequencies much more pronounced than you can when you're higher up. Now, when we get out of the bass range, we have a greater amount of modal density. So the modes are really independently operating and widely spaced out, really in the bottom end of the frequency spectrum, typically 300 Hertz or 200 Hertz and below. But as we go up in the frequency spectrum, we get more and more room modes. A lot of times they're overlapping with each other or they're very closely spaced. So you have an increasing amount of modal density and that tends to give you a much more smooth perception of the sound. The final psychoacoustic phenomenon I'll bring up in this video, just for your frame of reference, is intraoral crosstalk cancellation. And imagine you're sitting in a mixed position and you have a set of stereo speakers in front of you. They're set up in a nice equilateral triangle, so they're 30 degrees either side off center. 
Well, the average woman's ears are 14 centimeters apart. The average man's ears are 14.5 centimeters apart. Now, why does that matter? Because you have sound from the left speaker that's gonna be hitting the right ear, sound from the right speaker that's gonna be hitting the left ear. And because of the separation of the ears, you're gonna get a very slight delay. It happens to be that that delay is 0.27 milliseconds in a typical room. Okay, so you have sound from one speaker on one side, sound from one speaker on the other side that's hitting the opposite ear with a slight delay. And then because of the effects of head shadowing, anatomical transfer function and whatnot, you have an interaural or difference between the two ears, level difference and an interaural spectral difference. So you have direct sound from one speaker and delayed sound from a second speaker, both arriving at a single ear with a 0.27 millisecond delay. That time delay corresponds to a frequency of 1852 hertz to put that frequency at 180 degrees out of phase. So what that means is that there is going to be phase cancellation or a null from destructive interference at 1852 hertz. Where does that line up in the frequency spectrum? Well, it's right smack in the middle of the vocal intelligibility range. So if you're mixing in a room with speakers at 30 degrees like we all do, and you have that null, then psychoacoustically, you're gonna perceive that frequency as very, very low, and you're gonna to wanna to boost it. So you would use an EQ, you'd boost that frequency, and then listening to that music on headphones or in another room with a different type of sound presentation, that frequency is gonna jump out at you because once again, you were chasing ghosts and things that only existed on that playback system and in that acoustical environment. And this is what I mean by interaural crosstalk cancellation. I hope with these examples that you're kind of getting the impact that psychoacoustics can have and why we need to keep these in mind when we're mixing or critically listening to music. All right, that's about enough information for one video. I'll wrap it up here and I'll catch you on the next one.